Lopidon. Well, we're all together here, and uh, as you all know, the way this was originally set up, uh, I scheduled 90 minutes, an hour and a half, of program material for today, Wednesday, and I also scheduled another 90 minutes for tomorrow. And what I'm reminded of in what I'm about to tell you is uh, a joke that W.C. Fields once told. He talked about how there was some uh, sweepstakes where second prize was that you get to spend a week in Philadelphia, and first prize is you don't have to go. And I'm telling you there's a prize here if you can find a way to look at it positively. What I found after I prepared all of my materials is that I was able to edit them down just a bit and I was able to fit everything into one 90-minute session today. I know, I know, I know. The disappointment that you're feeling is palpable. Everybody on this conference was counting on 90 minutes plus 90 more minutes, three hours of patent cooperation treaty discussion. Not only today, but another hour and a half tomorrow. I know you were counting on it, but I'm gonna disappoint you. Uh, we will only have today's program. Tomorrow's program uh, will not be needed because we'll be able to cover the topics today. I know I'm seeing some comments here in the question box. I, yes, people are sharing my disappointment here. Anyway, so, uh, so let's, uh, let, let's uh, proceed here. First, a couple of disclaimers. Uh, although I do often uh, speak formally on behalf of WIPO, WIPO often does have me uh, give presentations on behalf of WIPO at various events and training activities and so on. This is not such an event, so I am not uh, speaking here officially on behalf of, of uh, WIPO. The other thing that's important uh, to mention is that this is not legal advice. Uh, you are not my client. Uh, I am not your lawyer. This is an educational program. It's a teaching opportunity, not a legal advice situation. Okay, so with that in mind, I will also talk about the format that I have in mind. As some of you know who have uh, heard me present before, I'm often pretty comfortable with a presentation where people ask questions as things go on, and so please feel free to ask questions as they come to mind. Use the question box. Another person says they can hear me clearly, uh, which might either be good news or bad news, I suppose, depending. Okay, anyway. Um, this is the slide in which I uh, receive, uh, deliver the bad news uh, or good news that in fact I was able to cram everything into today's 90 minute session. Um, will you receive a PDF after or will you need to screenshot the slides? Yes, you will receive a PDF after. In fact, I've prepared a handout and I will email it to everyone as soon as we finish. So um, yes, you will get the uh, handouts later. Why are we here? Uh, well, we're here uh, because of the uh, coronavirus. That's why we're here. And the coronavirus has affected everything about all of our lives. The uh, One of the ways that it has affected things is that everyone we know is working from home, including everybody at every patent office, and in particular, everybody at WIPO. And with work from home, in some ways that's a blessing, uh, but it becomes uh, particularly challenging from the point of view of doing paper mail. It's not so easy to print something, stick it in an envelope, lick the envelope, put a stamp on it, and mail it, because that requires people who show up, uh, people have to show up in the office to do these things. And so what WIPO did, uh, they announced on March 30th that they were simply going to stop sending out paper for PCT processing, PCT activities, uh, and 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 that's that's a thing. I mean, we all have to uh, pay attention to it. Uh, WIPO, of course, does not only do PCT. WIPO also does day-to-day -day activity for the Madrid Protocol System and for the Hague Agreement System. Uh, PCT being the international filing system for patents. Madrid Protocol being the international filing system for trademarks, and Hague Agreement being the international filing system for designs. Today's webinar is only going to talk about the PCT part. Uh, we're not going to try in today's program to talk about Madrid Protocol things or Hague things so far as going paperless is concerned. We are going to try to talk uh, very thoroughly about best practices uh, our narrow goal, our very narrow goal, of course, is to help you to deal with the paperless situation with PCT. 
and uh, and and again, this narrow goal is to make sure you don't miss out on anything uh, because of the fact that starting on March 30th, two days ago, WIPO is not going to drop stuff in the mail anymore. That's our narrow goal. Uh, having said that, we have a broader goal as well, which is to help everybody make sure that they are doing best practices. Best practices not only for how you file PCT applications, but for the um, ways that you uh, uh, can manage your PCT applications that are pending after they are filed. So uh, we have the narrow goal of dealing with the fact that WIPO is going to stop mailing stuff as of two days ago and this broader goal. The point of the broader goal is that it's going to give you some side benefits. The things that you're going to do because you have to do them because of what's going on here. The stuff that you have to do is going to offer side benefits uh, at no extra work, no extra cost, no extra effort. What are some of the side benefits? You are going to find situations where in your office you'll be able to work collaborative, collaboratively with colleagues better than you could before by using some of the things that we're going to be talking about today. You're going to be more efficient. You're going to be more productive. You're going to save time. And here, if we have any attorneys in this program, there are malpractice risks that will be reduced because of things that you'll be doing here just to deal with the uh, paperless situation. You will reduce risk of being embarrassed in front of your client, reduce the risk of making dumb mistakes that make you look stupid in front of your client. So these will be side benefits. These are gonna come along with no extra effort and no extra work because you're gonna be doing the things that we're gonna talk about in the next few minutes just to deal with being paperless. Um, okay, uh, somebody asks, would I give a similar presentation to today's presentation directed specifically to the USPTO patent stuff? Well, we'll see. It was really a lot of work setting this thing up for today, and I don't know if I have enough time and energy to do it twice. But anyway, um, another benefit that will come along free of charge, no extra effort because of the things that you're going to be doing because you're going to be dealing with this paperless PCT situation at no extra charge with no extra effort. You'll be doing things that will permit your docket department to do their job better with higher confidence. You'll be in a situation where things were already under control. That's what docket departments do, but they will be even more under control and it will be no extra effort. It will come along effortlessly cost free because of the things you're going to be doing in the next few minutes. Please, please, folks, find the patience, find the energy to listen to the things that we're going to talk about and, and be a good sport about learning the things that we're going to be asking you to learn. What are the detailed goals going to be? What are the things that we are going to hammer away at in the next few minutes? Number one, you're going to have to get a WIPO user ID and password if you don't already have one. You're going to have to suck it up and you're going to have to appreciate that each person has to have their own WIPO user ID and password you're not allowed to share. You're going to have to set up strong authentication. You're going to want to do e-handshakes with your colleagues. This sounds like Facebook friends or something, right? Sounds like social media. Sounds like stuff that us old people with gray hair don't know how to do, right? You'll be able to figure this stuff out. We're going to talk about it. It's not going to be too daunting. Now, what else? We're going to talk about the fact that there might be a PCT application that's pending, maybe one of yours, where you never actually told anybody an email address to use, and that as far as WIPO knew, the only thing they could do was send stuff out in postal mail. And if WIPO is going to stop sending postal mail, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to have to provide an email address. Uh, and we're going to talk about how to communicate that information to WIPO efficiently in a targeted way uh, so that it won't go wrong. Many, many U.S. practitioners are unaware. I know because I talk to them. Many U.S. practitioners are unaware that the EPCT system provided by WIPO delivers a mechanism that is like private pair. There's a thing that's like private pair for PCT. It lets you see your pending PCT applications just like you can see your pending US applications in private pair. It is a thing 
Uh, can any of us imagine living day to day without private pair? Of course not. Well, that's the way it needs to be for your PCT applications. Okay, uh, I'm seeing a whole bunch of comments here, uh, and let's just see if I can react to one or two of them. How long does a WIPO user ID and password last? Yeah, that's a good question. A WIPO user ID, it lasts uh, in perpetuity. Uh, the user ID lasts as long as you want it to last. The password, they do not force you to change your password, so that's really nice. You know, compare that with some other systems where, where, the, where other systems from other organizations or corporations where it forces you to change the password every so often, and I, I personally find that very annoying. And uh, uh, no, you don't have to. Uh, EPCT is better than certain other systems, says one of our commenters. Returning to our detailed goals, given that there is this thing in EPCT that is kind of like private pair, well, you're clearly going to want to make it so that when you file a new PCT application tomorrow or next week, you want it to be visible in that system that is kind of like private pair. When you file a regular US application, um, when you file a regular US application, what is it that you do that makes it so that you can later see it in private pair? Well, you, it turns out it's a customer number thing. You make sure that you set the customer number in a certain way. In the world of PCT, there's a thing that you do, and they don't have customer numbers like what you're thinking of in the U.S. situation, but there's a thing that you do so that when you file a PCT application, it will later be visible in the system that's kind of like private pair. One of our colleagues points out here correctly that if the strong authentication mechanism that you pick for your PCT your WIPO user ID and password, if the type of strong authentication you choose is the so-called digital certificate, the browser certificate, it does expire and need to be renewed. That's true. That's true. Uh, every two years. I We're going to talk about how when you send stuff to WIPO, clearly we need to like not send it on paper, of course. Uh, and on top of this, uh, you might sometimes need to send stuff to other places, like to an international searching authority, Korea, European Patent Office, something like that, or to uh, a preliminary examining authority. And the EPCT system can be very helpful uh, for electronically sending stuff to these other offices. Within the EPCT system, there are two ways to submit things, and one is called actions, the other is called uploads, and it turns out uh, that those aren't the same thing, and one of them is much better to use. One of our attendees says that she is not a fan of the digital certificate method of two-factor authentication in EPCT. Well, we will just have to have a private conversation about that. I think the digital certificate approach is by far the most convenient. Okay, what we see on the screen is a, uh, uh, a quote from the PDF form of the PCT request. What is the PCT request? Uh, the PCT request, of course, is the thing that we use to communicate our bibliographic data to the PCT system. Uh, stepping back a bit to look at the forest rather than the trees, anytime you file any patent application of any kind in any patent office anywhere in the world, common sense tells you there must be some way that you communicate stuff like who's the inventor, who's the applicant, are we claiming priority from something else, what's the title. All those things taken together are what we call bibliographic data. And common sense tells you, no matter what patent office it is, no matter what their electronic filing system is, there has to be a way that we communicate bibliographic data to the patent office. And in general, when you communicate bibliographic data, you want it to auto-load into the system of whatever patent office we're talking about. By the way, practice tip, if the place where you are e-filing is USPTO in EFS Web and you're filing a regular old domestic US patent application, what is the thing that you use to communicate bibliographic data? Well, of course, it's the application data sheet. Of course, what you would want is that that would auto-load into the USPTO systems. But it doesn't always auto-load. What are examples of ways that you can screw it up and have it not auto-load? Well, one is if the ADS is in an EFS web submission that is not the first one. 
if you already knew your application number and your confirmation number, it's already too late to hand in an ADS and expect it to auto load into the USPTO systems. You have to plan ahead and make sure the ADS is in that very first EFS web submission, the one where you did not yet know what your application number was. Only then will that ADS auto load into the USPTO system. That's just a little practice tip. Now in the world of PCT, which is our main focus today, the request is the name that we give to the thing that we use to communicate bibliographic data to the PCT system. In that request, there is box number four, which is what's on the screen. Box number four is the place where we say who the agent is. Um, this is where I fill in my own name and the name of my firm when I'm filing a PCT application. And many of you file PCT applications all the time and you get down to box number four and you fill in these blanks. It's part of your routine. And when you fill in these blanks, what are you filling in? Well, name, address, phone number, uh, stuff like that. And then there are these little boxes where you might choose to authorize uh, sending email to you. And if you did choose to authorize it, you could check one box or the other. You could say, I authorize you to send email and don't bother sending paper. That's the right-hand box at the bottom. Or the left-hand box at the bottom, I authorize sending email, but I also want paper. Or you might not check either box, in which case the way it's left is that supposedly uh, all the offices that participate in the PCT system would be obligated to send it to you on paper except that as of two days ago, that ain't gonna happen anymore. What about the fax number, one of our attendees asks. Yeah, faxes don't work anymore, not with voice over IP. It's a waste of time filling in a fax number on these things. Uh, go to my blog, Ant Like Persistence blog, and uh, uh, you know I've published blog articles about how the voice over IP uh, world that nearly all phones nowadays are voice over IP means that faxes generally don't work, at least not international faxes. So don't bother filling in a fax number here. Don't bother listing a fax number on the letterhead of your law firm. Don't bother listing a fax number on your website. Uh, somebody here says that if you check the left-hand box, you will still get paper documents from the searching authorities. Well, it depends which searching authority. Some searching authorities choose to use the left-hand box. It, well, it depends. Searching authorities differ from one to the next. The main point of my putting box number four on the screen is simply to say this is where we are in a pickle if we didn't check either box. If we didn't check either of those boxes, then right this minute, right this minute, WIPO is in a position where they don't know how to send email to you. All they know is that the way you left it was you wanted them to send paper mail, and two days ago, WIPO decided they weren't going to do that anymore, not in PCT cases. What has WIPO said? Well, uh, we will talk a little bit later about what WIPO does when it finds itself in a pickle because they're not sending paper anymore and maybe the only thing they, they don't have either of these boxes checked. But before I get to that, let me emphasize that what you see on the screen is a PDF version of the request and it is not the way people should file PCT applications. You should not be filing a PDF format request. Your request should be an electronically formatted request, electronically formatted in either PCT Safe or ePCT, and we will talk about that later in some detail. This PDF form of the request is simply being put on the screen as an easy discussion point to help us understand how, if you didn't check either box, given that WIPO isn't going to mail paper anymore, it's a problem. Oh, we have a greeting from a very nice person at WIPO. Uh, you also get my greetings. Very nice person at WIPO has just sent me a greeting in the chat. If you chose paper only in any PCT application that you filed in box four, then clearly there's an action item here. Somehow you must urgently let WIPO know what email address you'd like them to use. Common sense tells you you're going to have to because as of two days ago, WIPO is only going to use email. And if you didn't authorize them to use email, and if they're only going to, uh, uh, you know, if they're only going to send email and you haven't given them an email address and you haven't authorized email correspondence, it's a pickle. You might have checked the box that said, please do email followed by paper. 
if you did, then uh, then what? Well, ask yourself why. Why did you probably, why did you make that choice? Well, it's probably because you wanted to have a kind of a backup so that if something got wrong with, went wrong with the email, you'd still have the paper document showing up, uh, you know, as a sort of a backup in case something wrong with, went wrong with the email. Clearly, whatever it is that motivated you to pick that choice, email followed by paper, given that WIPO isn't going to mail out the paper anymore, you're going to want to set up some new thing that is largely uh, serving a similar function. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about. Finally, if you checked the box that said exclusively in electronic form, then you're not going to mind that WIPO doesn't send out paper mail anymore because they weren't going to send paper mail in that case anyway. Part of what this slide number 17 is uh, focusing on is there's just no choice about it. Every one of us who has a pending uh, docket that includes PCT applications, every one of us needs to go through every one of our cases that is less than 30 months old check them one by one and make sure that we know how did we fill in box number four and we need to go through that review without delay and make sure we know where we stand and perhaps take corrective action as necessary. So if you chose paper only, two action items at least. One, communicate email address to the International Bureau urgently. Uh, two, um, get it into what is called your EPCT workbench, that is to say, the function of EPCT that is the counterpart to what we all know as private pair. One of our attendees asks, can we designate multiple email addresses? The answer turns out to be no. But what you could do, uh, and what we do in our firm, is set up an email uh, forward uh, where a seemingly single email address, in fact, gets expanded automatically into multiple email addresses. That's the best practice. So you'll set up a forward, and then the email could go, say, to each person on your docket desk, plus also going to certain other people or something like that. Okay, so one of the action items here, clearly, and, and later you'll understand why I'm hammering away at this, one of the action items will, will be that you're going to want to get every one of your pending applications into the thing that is kind of like private pair, that you're, you're just going to want to do that. Now, uh, one person asked, well, what about the fax number you gave them? And the answer is no. WIPO also, almost a year ago, uh, said they're going to stop sending faxes for purposes of PCT. Um, WIPO has said in their announcement of two days ago that if you said paper only uh, and WIPO discovers they need to send you something, they will go, they don't call it a treasure hunt, I call it a treasure hunt. They'll go on a treasure hunt through the file to see if maybe there is some email address somewhere floating around in the file. And if so, in desperation, they'll send email to whatever that email address is, hoping beyond hope that it will work. The thing is, it might not be functioning. Whoever filled that in on some form or piece of stationery or something might have typed it wrong or something, right? So, uh, and in any event, it might not be the email address you would really want WIPO to be sending stuff to because it's not the docket desk or whatever. Uh, there's clearly no substitute for explicitly communicating to WIPO the actual email address you really want them to use. Now, um, one of our commenters is pointing out EPCT is really the lifeboat here, and of course that person is right. And in a minute I will talk about why, why I think that is so. How are you going to communicate this stuff to the International Bureau, like the email address or the updated email address? Well, you might already have the, the thing that's like private pair, the so-called EPCT workbench. You might already have that functioning in your office, in which case you didn't need to attend this webinar today, frankly, because you already knew everything I'm going to be talking about. But if you already had all your PCT applications in your workbench, then you can use the EPCT system to upload anything you want, um, including like an updated contact email address or something. Oh, one of our attendees says, can you communicate groups of cases? Uh, by which I think she's trying to ask, could you do one communication to update multiple files at once? Uh, yes, there's a way you can do that. Um, 
uh, the folks at WIPO are prepared to be very helpful, just like you could do a 92 bis change and, and, and you could ask somebody at WIPO, please apply this across the board to multiple files. Um, uh, but the multiple 92, uh, 92 bis uh, submission would be the typical way to do that. Suppose you don't already have the PCT application that we're talking about already in your EPCT workbench. Well, then there is still a way to do what is uh, called an upload to any PCT application through uh, EPCT. Uh, uh, Oh, one of our nice WIPO people points out that there's an article about that in the FAQs on the WIPO website, and of course there is. It's actually a pretty good FAQ. Um, yep. Uh, okay. Uh, finally, the absolute last resort, and, and this is, I, I hate to even mention this possibility, but I have to just to be thorough. If you can't figure out any other way to communicate what you need to to the folks at WIPO about this stuff that's going on, the paperless stuff dealing with email addresses as of the announcement of two days ago, if you literally can't find any other way to deal with your crunch situation, you could send an email to one of these two email addresses. Please don't. It can't possibly be the right thing to do, right? You could surely use one of these electronic communication mechanisms that's more sophisticated. Imagine what life is like for the people who are answering those email addresses right now. They are swamped uh, with emails from all kinds of different people. Um, one of our people asks, uh, she says, I use EPCT. She says, I checked the box that said I want email only, but she says from EPO, I'm still getting stuff only on paper. Why? Will they start communicating by email? Well, that's just a reminder that the searching authorities differ from one to the next in the extent to which they might or might not choose to pay attention to the box that you checked in box number four of your request. Nothing in the PCT system obligates a searching authority to necessarily uh, follow what you said in box number four. And individual searching authorities are permitted to make their own choices about how to communicate with PCT applicants. Um, I don't know about EPO uh, going forward if they're going to eventually plan to go to electronic communication. I have to guess that eventually they might, given you know all the work from home that's going on nowadays and everything. But uh, um, and one of our attendees says, "Sorry, the search report is not provided electronically. Uh, not the enclosures. Yep, yep. From the EPO is what this person is saying. Okay. Anyway." If you're going to use EPCT to communicate something such as an updated email address to the International Bureau, how do you do it? Well, I think the best way to do it is uh, the assumption here is that you already got a WIPO user ID and password, and then you fire up your EPCT, and there's a box, you, there's a link you can click that's called Find International Application Outside of My Workbench. Well, it says find IA, but soon enough you'll catch on. The folks at WIPO think that everyone knows what IA means, and, and of course what it means is international application, outside of my workbench, and then this thing will pop up, and you'll put in the application number, the filing date, and then you'll click a thing that says I want to upload some documents, and the um, uh, what will happen is it will get loaded into the appropriate file at WIPO. Electronically, it will go into the correct file. So you never have to wonder what if it accidentally got into the wrong file. Um, so this is, this is uh, pretty close to a best practice for those cases where the PCT application we're talking about is one that you did not already have in your workbench, that was not already in the system that's kind of like private pair. Um, this assumes that you have a WIPO user ID and password. Um, if you didn't have a WIPO user ID and password, and if somehow you're absolutely convinced that it's not within your abilities to somehow get a WIPO user ID and password, there is a system called the PCT Contingency Upload Service. I will talk it through. You go to the PCT Contingency Upload Service. You enter your email address twice. They have to match. You can't use uppercase in one and lowercase in the other. If they match, you will click Submit. The system will then send you an email with a link in it. It won't send it right away. When I tested it earlier today, it took three minutes. Three minutes. 
three minutes it took, I'm talking to someone at WIPO right now, three minutes it took for that email to show up. Then I clicked on the link. Uh, I then filled in a couple blanks, including the PCT application number and filing date. And then uh, I would have been able to upload a document and it would go into the correct file. So you never have to worry about it not going into the correct file. The thing is, why use this contingency upload service when you know you're going to have to get a WIPO user ID and password anyway. It's just part of being trendy, modern, and up-to-date, in which case you can use the one that's find an in, uh, international application outside of my workbench. And then we must not lose sight of the fact that we all have a medium-term goal, at least, that we will eventually get all of our pending PCT applications into the system that is kind of like private pair. One of our attendees says, do you have to upload this for every single application separately? And the answer is no. You could just concoct something in your word processor that says, uh, please update this for all the following cases, list them all one by one, and upload it. And a nice person at WIPO will, be, will very patiently go through and manually post it to all the files for you. They are used to this. They're very good sports about it. Um, OK, so now suppose you absolutely couldn't manage to do any of the things we just said. Well, your fallback position um, is send an email to one of these two email addresses. And there are at least two reasons why this is not a best practice. Number one, the people who answer these emails are miserable right now. Number one, they're working from home and that makes it harder because their systems run slower and stuff. Number two, they are swamped because there are millions of filers who are dinosaurs and can't figure out how to do anything by any means other than sending an email. So these people are swamped and Whatever you send them, it isn't automatically loaded into the correct file at WIPO, so they have to post it into the correct file. And then you have to wonder, what if they didn't put it into the right file or something, right? So uh, they are not going to put it in the wrong file. That's not what I mean, but, you know, you just have to wonder. Uh, one of our attendees asks, does your WIPO account have to link to an attorney if you are a paralegal or staff? Oh, the person who asked this question is probably thinking of what a bruising experience it sometimes is to be working with EFS Web, where you are constantly reminded that you're kind of a second class citizen if you're not a registered practitioner, right? In the EPCT system, everything about how it's designed makes it very easy to uh, give everybody whatever permissions they need to do their job. And whoever gains access to the file, it might be a paralegal is the one who gained access, in which case they're the ones who can give permission to their boss to have access to the file. Whoever got there first, they give the permission to the other people in their office. Uh, what I'm really getting at here is that in the EPCT system, um, it, it works the way you sort of wish it would work. All the members of a team who collaborate, who work together on tasks where people help each other out with different stages in the process of some recurring task, all the people who work together are able to work together comfortably, and you don't have to be constantly thinking, oh, is so-and-so an attorney? Is so-and-so a paralegal? You're not constantly reminded of stuff like that. It doesn't get in the way of getting work done. Again, again, assuming that what you might have chosen, and as many people uh, choose, is email followed by paper, why did you choose that? Well, because you said to yourself, yeah, yeah, I like email, but I, you know, I like getting paper too. You know, what if something goes wrong with the email? What if it gets stuck in a spam folder? Uh, whatever. Uh, I like having, you know, the paper show up. And if somebody feels that way, I can't blame them. That's a perfectly normal, sensible judgment a person might make. And if WIPO isn't going to mail the paper anymore, what can you do? The answer is you get it into your EPCT workbench. You get it into the system that's kind of like private pair because later private pair, the, the system that's like private pair, the so-called workbench, it will automatically notify you every time a new document gets into your file. It will automatically tell you every time a significant status change occurs. It will automatically remind you of certain things. Uh, let's go back to some of the questions that came in. Some of these are very good questions. The email address you provide, can it be a general email not assigned to any particular individual? I'm delighted to tell you the answer is yes. 
You can make it any email you want, and indeed in our office, it's an email that's not tied to any particular human being. It's an email that is just chosen uh, so that it's, uh, you know, it forwards through to all the necessary people. Okay. How does WIPO authenticate that the email that was uploaded actually belongs to the right people? Well, in general, usually under ordinary circumstances when we don't have like coronavirus going on, is that WIPO would authenticate any submission the same way they always authenticate everything. Namely, something got filed, maybe it was delivered on by paper, maybe it was faxed, maybe it was sent in with a FedEx package, uh, whatever, it got sent to WIPO somehow, they don't just automatically do stuff just because somebody sends something in. The folks at WIPO apply business process rules, and depending on how severe, how, how striking, how important the change might be, they give quite a bit of scrutiny to certain changes, like if you want to withdraw an application or change who the applicant is, they look pretty darn closely. They look to see who signed, Depending on who signed, they look and see, does this person have power of attorney? Uh, they'll cross-check against the power of attorney. They apply sanity checks to these things. And 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 I, I've talked to some of the people on the processing teams. They um, Some of it's documented and some of it is just sort of common sense, being smart about it the way you would hope they would. In certain contexts, you know, if they see it's a filing from a firm they work with all the time and it's consistent with all the other filings, I think they react one way. And when they get a filing that looks very out of the ordinary, that looks for all the world like a sneaky person is trying to take over a file or make some kind of trouble, you know, they have antennas that wiggle and, and they'll notice and they'll they'll uh, try as best they can to uh, figure out, uh, you know, whether they want to look more closely at a piece of paper or something. Here with the coronavirus going on, it's making it tough, I'm sure, for the folks at WIPO because they're probably getting random submissions, emails. How do you have any idea whether that email is from somebody who has authority to speak for the attorney or whatever? Um, that's a tough one. But uh, ideally, what you would do is you would use one of the official e-filing mechanisms, and then that would help the folks at WIPO get a little head start in the direction of having a sense of where it came from and who the signer was and does it cross-check against a power of attorney, perhaps, that is already in the file. By the way, this would be a good time as any to make darn sure that you hand in powers of attorney when you're trying to make changes, because the folks at WIPO, if they don't have a power of attorney in the file, it's harder for them to be in a position of knowing for sure that the document is what it purports to be. Okay, uh, let me just click through a couple more of the questions. I find it difficult to give access to my attorney for them to sign, especially when I upload documents for an application outside of my workbench. Oh, no, say it's not so. You find it difficult to get your attorney to do electronic stuff? Am I to understand that you are trendy, modern, and up-to-date, and your attorney is a dinosaur? Is that what we're dealing with here? Oh, say it's not so. Well, there is the method of the so-called external signature, external signature, which can be used for some categories of submissions. The external signature, I'm not going to dwell upon it here today. Uh, it would take a long time to cover it thoroughly, but the external signature mechanism, which is covered in the online help sections, sometimes will help when you have a difficult dinosaur boss who somehow can't manage to, you know, you tell them click any key and they say, I don't see a key that says any on it, right? Okay. Um, if the paralegal needs to upload documents on behalf of an attorney, do they sign as the attorney in the signatory line? No, that isn't the right answer. Ideally, what happens is the paralegal and the attorney are both users in the EPCT system, each with their own logins. The paralegal could prepare a submission, save the submission. The attorney could then log in and then apply the necessary signature and then perhaps click submit. That would be a normal, typical collaborative workflow. Oh, and then I see a thank you from the person who uh, heard me talking about their boss, the dinosaur. All right. Can the attorney sign the doc, then email it to the paralegal? Oftentimes, this would be an approach that you might use in desperation. The attorney might, in fact, do an ink signature if necessary, and then you, like, scan it into a PDF, and then the paralegal may end up having to upload that image-based PDF into the system. Sometimes that's what you got to do. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do, and that might be, in fact, it. 
What about an electronic signature? Well, you could do an electronic signature, not 37 CFR 1.4. WIPO doesn't recognize those, but two virgules with the person's entire name between them, WIPO will recognize that. Okay, back to uh, what happens if what you chose was email followed by paper, which means you wanted to have something else as a backup in case the email got lost. The answer is, get it into your EPCT workbench, the thing that is kind of like private pair, because that system will automatically notify you every time a new document ends up in your file. Okay, we will now talk through the steps that it takes to make that happen. We will talk it through. First, you get a WIPO user ID and password. To do this, you go to pct.wipo.int and you create an account. Uh, you would have to spell the word account correctly, which I did not do on this screen. You will then get an email with a link. You will click on the link and then Bob will be your uncle. With this point, we will now go to a polling question. Do you already have a WIPO user ID and password? I will tell you that right now while this poll is going, there are people at WIPO who are attending this and they are on the edge of their seats. The folks at WIPO are saying, oh, please, 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 please. I would like it that almost everyone already had a WIPO user ID and password. Okay, we're gonna close the polling on this and we are going to share the results of our attendees. 66% already had a WIPO user ID and password but I am sorry to say a full 22% did not yet have a WIPO user ID and password. Of course, the 22%, you know, you know what you got to do. You got to get yourself a WIPO user ID and password. And it's easy. It's like three mouse clicks or something. It's, 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 not, it's not tough. It's okay. Um, now we have here a promise, a very nice person whose initials are LL, who uh, works in the Danish patent office, in the receiving office. And, and this person has promised that everybody in the receiving office, uh, in the Danish patent office, will be helpful in adding emails to these things. I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Um, it, 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 you could consider communicating stuff to a receiving office and you could ask them to, uh, pass it along to the International Bureau, I will suggest to you that by far best practice is send it straight to the International Bureau. Rather than filtering it through um, a receiving office, that's just extra processing steps. Send it straight to the International Bureau. But thank you for the greetings from RODK. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Uh, somebody here asked, is the WIPO user ID and password the same one that you use for your online courses? Yes, it is. Yes, isn't that good news? It is uniform across all of the WIPO platforms. So if you already, for example, took the WIPO distance learning course for PCT, you already had a WIPO user ID and password, and you can use the same one for all this EPCT stuff. Or if you already had a WIPO user ID and password for your Hague Agreement filings or your Madrid protocol, uh, your M Madrid portfolio manager stuff, yes. Or for the DAS system, yes. The same user ID and password that you already got, you don't have to get a new one for this. You can just use it for PCT as well. Oh, one of our people at WIPO says, call it a WIPO account. WIPO account so that people understand it's the same thing. Okay, WIPO user ID is apparently the same as WIPO account. This, this just shows you how I just kind of assume that everything has the same name as everything else. WIPO account. Okay, does everybody know what Bob's your uncle means? Okay, thank you. Now, no sharing. You're not allowed to share. If you click around in the web, WIPO website, you'll find places where WIPO makes very clear they don't want sharing. Why? Because what they don't want is if you shared and then later somebody leaves your firm, maybe under bad circumstances, and now all of a sudden, you know, you don't want them to be able to log in anymore and it's a big problem. And then it means everybody's going to have to like change their password or something. The folks at WIPO don't want to have to deal with this. They want everybody to have their own individual user ID, their own individual WIPO account and password so that you could shut down an individual account or shut down the access to an individual account for purposes of EPCT without the folks at WIPO having to deal with internal squabbles within your firm. Uh, and then we have not one, but two different people who want to know what Bob's your uncle means. Uh, 
Okay. Go to Wikipedia, plug in Bob's your uncle. And that's that's where you're going to get the answer. Or or uh, go to uh, go to um, the ant like persistence blog and plug in Bob's your uncle in the search box. I explain it there. How can I update my WIPO account from a past employer to my current email? Um, Another person asks, can you keep your WIPO account when you change jobs? And the answer is, if you still have access to the old email address, there is a way that you can go in and change what email address is uh, is functional on your WIPO account. If, on the other hand, you no longer have access to your old email address, then the thing to do is just create a new WIPO account and just abandon the old one. Um, but if you still have access to the old email address, you can just update it. Oh, somebody says here that there's also an expression, Fanny's your aunt. I didn't know that. Okay, setting up strong authentication. There are three ways to do it. Uh, the so-called authenticator app that you might put on your smartphone, although I do it on my PC using something co called WinAuth, or text messaging on your phone, or a browser certificate. And one of our attendees whose initials are SV, she said that she hates the browser certificate approach, but I love the browser certificate approach. What's wonderful about the browser certificate, yes, it's a little bit of a fuss to get it installed onto your browser and stuff, but once it's there, then for two years, you never have to do the second factor because it's already in your browser. So it saves all kinds of trouble. Oh, here. Thank you. Thank you. One of our attendees who initials are MS, she agrees with me. Yes, thank you. We have people who agree with me. Once you get, yes, it's a little fuss setting up the certificate, but once you do, it saves you so much trouble for the next two years. Of course, back up the certificate. Yes, thank you. Uh, Anne at WIPO says, be sure to have a backup copy. Be sure to back it up. Save it on a file server in your office. Save it on a thumb drive in your desk so that later if you could get the browser certificate uh, loaded into other browsers, you know, when your computer crashes or gets run over by a truck, um, you should set up at least two kinds. Uh, you get to pick which two, but you always set up at least two kinds so that if one of them somehow gets bollocked up and you can't get it to work anymore, you can still use the other of the two kinds to get things straightened out. So always set up at least two kinds of two-factor authentication. Now, with this in mind, uh, let's have a little poll. The folks at WIPO are going to love this one. They're on the edge of their seats. I know they are. Oh, I wonder how many of our users already have strong authentication set up. The folks at WIPO are wondering right now. Well, let's give truthful answers here. Don't sugarcoat it, folks. Just say it how it is. Do you or do you not have strong authentication set up? All right, we have votes from about 70% of our people. I'm going to close the voting, and I'm going to share the answers that we got. Smaller percentage than before, a mere 59% have throng, uh, strong authentication set up. 17% are not sure whether they have strong authentication set up, and 24% say no. Well, clearly, folks, those of you who are in the 24% or 17% category, you got some work to do here. Get your strong authentication going. You got to do it. You got to do it. Yep, if you're going to be mon trendy, modern, and up to date, it's a requirement. Now, uh, one of our people uh, asks, uh, if you do use WinAuth, can you use WinAuth on like two different, uh, can you use it for both my USPTO and for WIPO? Absolutely. Yeah, you just take the secret code number from the USPTO thing, put that into your WinAuth, and also take the secret code number from WIPO and put that into your WinAuth. And then I save all the secret code numbers in another place, and then I put it into a... a, a uh, put it into an authenticator on my smartphone and somewhere else. Does WIPO rate the strength of your authentication? No, they also don't second guess whether they think your password is good enough, which I think is wonderful. Good news. Can you use a U.S. mobile number for authentication? Yes, that's true. You can. E-handshakes. It turns out that in the world of EPCT, there are what are called handshakes. And handshakes sound an awful lot like Facebook friends. And I have never used up Facebook. I never used Facebook with like friends or whatever. But apparently in the world of Facebook. But anyway, the point is there are consequences to making somebody your friend in Facebook. In contrast, there is no harm making someone your handshake buddy in EPCT. If you make somebody your handshake buddy, it doesn't mean that they get to see your PCT files, for example. 
Um, oh, one of our attendees asks, can I use an Indian phone number for the uh, text message authentication? I think the answer is yes. Are e-handshakes exempt from social distancing requirements? Yes, because they are made of recycled electrons. Gosh darn it, of course. Okay. Anyway, you might as well do e-handshakes with everybody. Everybody in your office, everybody at your various clients that you deal with. If you're with a corporation, do e-handshakes with everybody at your outside council. Do e-handshakes with your house pets. Just kidding, just kidding. But you do e-handshakes with everybody. There's just no harm in it. And once you've done the e-handshakes in advance, uh, then you are uh, all set up so that later when the time comes that you need to share access with somebody, um, it will, uh, you, you know, you're already uh, most of the way there and then you can give somebody access. Uh, getting an EPCT workbench. Well, I've talked about how you need to get a workbench, this thing that is kind of like private pair. And it turns out that the minute you set up your two-factor authentication, you automatically get the EPCT workbench in an automatic way. You don't have to do anything further. Oh, one of our WIPO people says, if you were in the United States and the text messaging wasn't working, be sure to put a plus one in front. Be sure to put a plus one. Okay. Anyway, when you first get that workbench, it'll be empty. There won't be any files in it, which is pretty boring. But of course, if you are trendy, modern, and up to date, as we urge everyone here to be, you will soon have all of your pending PCT applications in your workbench. Um, and with this in mind, let me see about launching a poll. Have you already done at least one handshake with someone else? One of our people asks, is there a way to get a WIPO digital certificate if you do not have Internet Exploder? Uh, one of our nice people at WIPO says, no, you have to use Internet Exploder to get the uh, certificate. Um, maybe that's so. What you could do is borrow a friend's computer that has Internet Exploder and just do that process on your friend's computer and then uh, do a backup of it and, and then later import it into Chrome on your own computer. So just borrow a friend's computer if you have to. Okay, we're going to close this polling. And what do we find? We find that a full 67% of our attendees have not ever done at least one e-handshake with anybody else. Clearly, folks, if you're going to be trendy, modern, and up-to-date, you got some work to do here. Uh, I will tell you with a certain measure of pride that as of a year ago, I don't know if it's still true, but as of a year ago, I had the most e-handshakes with people of any user of EPCT. Clearly, if you start with an empty workbench, the uh, uh, the empty workbench that is the thing that's kind of like private pair, for it to provide the benefits that we think of as private pair kind of benefits, you got to get every one of your pending cases into the system. How do you do it? How do you do it? Well, it turns out um, we're going to talk about how you do it. You click a few times and you do a couple steps. Then what you do is give access to your colleagues. Um, somebody asked, by the way, can Microsoft Edge be used instead of Internet Exploder? I think the answer is no, uh, as a way of downloading your certificate. Somebody here asks, uh, is Bob's your, oh, uh, is explaining, Bob's your uncle is the UK equivalent of the American expression easy as pie. Yes, that's true. Um, getting applications into your EPCT workbench, and it turns out the steps you have to follow turn out to be different depending on whether your case is or is not in patent scope, the case that you're trying to add, and we will now talk about it. Uh, suppose it's a case that's in patent scope. Um, well, then what will happen is you'll go into EPCT and you'll click uh, on find IA outside of my workbench, and you'll recall there's this secret thing here that I've clued you in on that IA means international application. Find international application outside of my workbench and then you'll fill in the application number, the filing date, request access rights, and then you'll click one or two more times and then what will happen is the folks at WIPO will prepare form PCT IB 345. It will contain a secret code number and they will email it to whatever email address is on file. Imagine the irony here that if the reason you're doing it, this is that they don't have an email address on file, they're not going to be able to email it to you, right? But anyway, um, anyway, so if the case was in patent scope, what will happen is you'll follow these steps. Form IB345 will be emailed to whatever the email address is of record on the file. 
and then that secret code number will you'll come back to this very same screen and you'll put in the secret code number and then you'll have access in your workbench the access that's like private pair and then you will give access rights of course to your colleagues question is can you do an e-handshake if the person doesn't have a wipo account yet and the answer is no and what's more if they don't have two-factor authentication going you can't do an e-handshake so they the person you're planning to do the handshake with, they have to be trendy, modern, and up-to-date. Yep. Mm -hmm. Only trendy, modern, and up-to-date people can do e-handshakes e with you. The other possibility is that the case was not yet published, uh, in which case you have form IB301 somewhere in your file, and it's a form that nobody else has seen yet because it hasn't been published in patent scope, and there's a secret code number in the lower right hand corner and that secret code number is going to give you access to the system that is kind of like private pair and you'll go to this screen and you'll fill in a few blanks and it will give you access somebody asks here is it possible to add your cases to pct all at once via 92 bits the answer is no um, if however you have a whole bunch of cases that you want to add to your workbench drop an email to the folks at WIPO and they will try as hard as they can to help you load them all at once um, in a coordinated way. Uh, they'll try. Uh, sometimes it's not easy for them, but if they're able to work out how to recognize that you really do have legitimate access to all the cases, they'll try as hard as they can help. Um, <clears throat> if the email address on file is a general firm docketing email address, how will you get the secret code number? Well, you have to go make friends with the docketing people maybe bring in some donuts or something and you know sit there next to the donut the docketing people and say hey that email that you're going to get in a few minutes from the folks at wipo will you share with me the secret code number that's what you got to do that's how people get stuff done donuts gifts you know i mean you gotta make things work all right they're in another state all right well then this is what federal express packages are for um yeah so if you want to add multiple cases at once uh, contact PCT eServices at pct.services.adwipo.int, um, yeah, or by using the chat service in the FAQ section. Okay, why do we care? Why is it that I am all wound up to say to you that you should be using the system that is kind of like private pair? Well, of course, it's because it's trendy, modern, and up-to-date. Of course, that's the real reason, but also because you will get a variety of benefits, uh, including being protected against all kinds of potential embarrassment in front of your clients. Uh, you'll, you'll be guarded against certain categories of missing deadlines that might lead to malpractice claims and so on. There are a bunch of benefits that would follow. Um, but before I get to that, here's a polling question. And for the folks at WIPO, you'll love this question. For our attendees, we have 225 attendees right now, by the way, who are on every continent except Antarctica. And our 225 attendees, do you already have at least one pending PCT application visible to you in your EPCT workbench? All right, the answer is only 44% of our people have at least one pending PCT application visible to them in their workbench. 47% say no. Those 47%, you clearly have some work to do here. Get cases into your workbench. Oh, and one of our attendees whose initials are SV says, how sad. Yeah, she, she, she's a person who has many PCT cases in her workbench, I know that. Okay, so we're gonna hide that result. Now, we're just gonna see how we're doing here. Do you think that probably you have every one of your pending PCT applications visible to you in your EPCT workbench? The folks at WIPO are gonna be on the edge of their chairs. They're rooting for it. They're saying, oh, please, please, please. I want it to be a lot of people who have every one of their pending PCT applications in their workbench. Let's just find out how we're doing here. All right, I'm gonna shut down the voting. 31% of our people attending, approximately 70 of our 225 attendees, are able to say that they think they probably have every one of their pending PCT applications visible to them in their EPCT workbench. More than half feel that they cannot say that, and 12% are not sure. 
Well, if we want to be trendy, modern, and up-to-date, and of course we all do, we have work to do. Yep. Now, we have a person whose initials are VR, and for those of you who had not yet set up a WIPO account or strong authentication, here is what fellow attendee VR writes. She says, I've set up a WIPO account with strong authentication while we were sitting here. She goes on to say, quite easy. So you folks who have not yet done it, you have no excuse. VR, our colleague, found it to be quite easy. Since WIPO officials are here, says one of our attendees, can we request having them look into having PCT certified copies available via DAS? We especially need this while filing EP divisional applications, which are filed by referencing the PCT application. What this person is asking is, if we filed an application in a receiving office, can that receiving office please be a depositing office for purposes of DAS? Well, it turns out that you can ask the folks at WIPO. They can't make that happen. The folks in the receiving office are the ones that we need to try to influence. And I will tell you, go to the Ant-like Persistence blog and plug in in the search box, Commissioner for Patents, and you will see that, uh, uh, that a group of practitioners organized by the Ant-like Persistence blog wrote a letter to the Commissioner for Patents at the USPTO specifically asking that the ROUS join DAS as a depositing office. Uh, so, you know, you could do a similar thing with whatever receiving office uh, you are concerned about here. Can you add a PCT application that has been filed by a foreign associate to the workbench? Absolutely. Absolutely. I do this all the time. I go in and I request access. They mail form IB345 to the foreign associate. And then the foreign associate forwards the form to me, and that gives me the secret code number, and I then gain access in EPCT, and then I give access to the foreign associate. Absolutely, you can do that. I do it all the time. I've done it more than 2,000 times with one particular foreign associate. Can I get a case on my EPCT workbench if I'm not on the power of attorney? Absolutely. You just somehow get your hands on form IB345 and Bob's your uncle. Um, oh, here's another person whose initials are DS, and he says he set up an account and strong authentication in about three minutes during this webinar. Folks, you have no excuse. Um, did I get the letter out to EU IPO about joining DAS? Uh, I'm going to take it to the post office in a few minutes, folks. Um, okay, let's see here. Alrighty. Anyway, why do we care about getting the cases into your workbench? This is an example. Here's an email that I received in a real case. Dear Carl Opadol, the time limit for filing a demand will expire in about two weeks. Suppose I was concerned that I might miss this deadline for doing a Chapter 2 demand. This would give me two weeks warning. This is an example of a benefit of having this case pending in your uh, EPCT workbench, the function that is kind of like private pair. Or as another example, wouldn't it be nice to get a little reminder that your 30 months is coming around? Yes, and this system will tell you your 30 months is coming around. Or that some new document has been filed in your PCT application. You'll get a notification that a new document has been filed. Um, Somebody says here, if I use EPCT to file with the U.S. Receiving Office, do I first need a foreign filing license? We will talk about that a little bit later, but the answer is no. And you can just leave out the title and leave out the abstract, and then you won't have to worry about that. But anyway, the answer is no. The USPTO is about to do a rules change that will make that particularly uh, uh, something you don't have to worry about. In the world of EPCT, there is something called access rights. When you give somebody access rights to a file after having done an e-handshake with them, you can pick how much uh, access they have. You can make them a mere e-viewer, which means they can look but don't touch. You can make them an e-editor, which means they can do more stuff. Or you can make them an e-owner, which means they have the ability to give access rights to other people. Um, within your own organization, within your own office, I suggest just make everybody an e-owner. You might as well. Um, uh, E-viewer is perfect if you're going to give access, say, to an inventor, uh, an applicant, uh, somebody outside. Um, 
Now, when somebody asks, what about these email notifications, like that your 30 months is coming around or that a new document has been filed, does it go to everybody who has the application in their own workbench? And the answer is yes. So what you want to do is everybody who would like to receive notifications, they should get it into their own workbench, perhaps as an e-viewer. Okay, so uh, next, clearly, clearly when you file a brand new U.S. ordinary domestic application, you want it to be visible in private pair, right? How do you make it happen? With a customer number. This makes you think here, um, how do you make so that when you file a new PCT application, it will be visible to you in the thing that is kind of like private pair, namely your EPCT workbench. And the answer is two different things, depending on whether the place you're filing is ROUS or ROIB. And we will now talk through each of them very, very briefly. Um, let's see here. So suppose you're filing in ROUS. Well, this means that the place you're filing is in EFS Web, of course. And you could, in EFS Web, prepare your PCT request as a P PDF file, a fillable PDF. And if you do it, this slide is telling you that's tantamount to malpractice um, because no validations take place. When you're in EFS Web and you're getting ready to file a PCT application, you're going to get to the one of the first screens that says, are you attaching a zip file? And what you do not want to do is check the no box because no is the choice that is tantamount to malpractice. You want to check the yes box because you do want to attach a zip file. The zip file contains all of your bibliographic data, like who's the inventor, who's the applicant, are we claiming priority, what's the title? And in particular, the software that created your zip file cross checks all your responses against each other to catch you if you're about to make some stupid mistake. So you want to do that. How do you make the zip file? Two choices, PCT safe or EPCT. How do you pick between those two ways? Well, if you're already super comfortable with PCT safe, then, you know, then if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Keep using PCT safe uh, in the near term, but be prepared to migrate to EPCT because there are a lot of benefits to it. Otherwise, if you had not been using PCT safe in the past, just skip over that and go straight to using EPCT. The zip file means that you got the benefit of validations. The software cross-checked the different inputs you provided like that your applicant was from Argentina, which is not a party to the PCT or whatever. It reduces the risk of embarrassment. It reduces the risk of malpractice. You want to be creating a zip file and uploading it to EFS Web if the place where you're going to file is in the ROUS, the U.S. Receiving Office. Why do I think EPCT is better? Because it validates all the same things that PCT Safe does, but it also validates more things. What else does it validate? It validates your priority application. It cross-checks your priority claim information against DAS, which we will now focus on. But first, we have a couple questions that came in. Are old applications that you filed using paper or PCT safe accessible in EPCT? And the answer is yes, if you want them to be. Just do what it takes to get them into EPCT. Uh, in one of the earlier slides, we had the little place where you click on uh, gain access to an international application that is not in your workbench, and you just click, follow the steps. They mail out form IB345, and uh, next thing you know, uh, that old application will be accessible in EPCT, which is very helpful. Somebody asked, will the slides for this webinar be made available? Yes, I will mail them out later. Um, okay. What am I getting at? Oh, in a minute, we'll talk about DAS, but first we'll talk about ROIB. If you're going to file an ROIB, of course, just use EPCT. It's wonderful. It's easy. It's web-based. It's very convenient. It validates all your inputs. It's a best practice. And then, of course, you just have to pay attention. If your invention happened to have been made in the United States, you want to make sure you have a foreign filing license. But you probably will have one in your priority document. And if your PCT does not have substantive amounts of new matter above and beyond what was in your priority document, then that foreign filing license will cover. DAS. Okay, we're going to talk about the DAS system. And when people talk about DAS, a lot of times 
the impression they get is that the only reason we care about DAS is that it's a way to not have to send physical certified copies from here to there and that that's wonderful because then you don't have to spend money on Federal Express charges or whatever. That's not the real reason we care about DAS, it turns out. The real reason we care has to do with a completely different things. Namely, it lets you do a real-time validation of your priority claim. Why do we care about that? Well, if you started making lists of all the different ways that people can screw stuff up when they're filing a, a patent application, things that could lead to a malpractice lawsuit later, most of the things we can screw up are fixable. We all know that. If you let it go abandoned, you can file a petition to revive. If you used up your time, you could get an extension of time for this or that or the other thing. Oh, something got done wrong, you could file a petition and probably fix it. You know, something, something isn't right, pay some money. Something's wrong, oh, you're very, very sorry. You say you're very sorry, problem goes away. But there are a handful of things where if they go wrong, it can't be fixed. It doesn't matter how sorry you are. It doesn't have, matter how much money you're willing to pay. It doesn't matter how good your excuse is. And priority claims is one of them. If you screw up a priority claim and don't manage to clean it up, within the four and 16 time period for purposes of many, many countries around the world. It is too bad, so sad, can't be fixed, and it doesn't matter how sorry you are, and it doesn't matter how good your excuse is, and it doesn't matter how much money you're willing to pay. Um, and this is why the real reason that we all use DAS, because DAS makes it so that when you're preparing your PCT request, you can cross check against DAS and you'll be absolutely sure you didn't type an application number wrong or a filing date wrong or use the wrong two letter code to say which office it was filed in. That's the real reason we care about DAS. Somebody asks here, when you're using ePCT to prepare the request, does it save contact information about inventors and applicants? Yes, it does. It has an address book and you can save all your inventors, all your applicants, the agent, save them in an address book. And later when you've got a repeat offender, you know, you're filing another PCT for the same applicant, you can just drag those things in out of the address book. And if you spelled it right before, it is still spelled right when you bring it from the address book into your second, third, fourth, fifth PCT request. Not only that, folks, oh, you're going to love this. All you have to do is do an e-handshake and you can share your address book with your colleagues in the office through ePCT so that your colleague can get the benefit of the fact that you save the name of the inventors of a certain company and they can use your address book to populate their request. Um, yeah, yeah. Did I mention it's good to learn how to use ePCT? I don't know if I mentioned that, but anyway, it's good to know how to use ePCT. Okay. So for this to work, every application you file that has the potential of being a priority document has to be in the DAS system, which means if it's a provisional, you can't use a provisional cover sheet. You got to use an ADS because that's the only way it's going to get into the DAS system. Can you file a chapter two demand electronically instead of fax filing? Yes. Yes, you can go into ePCT, file your demand through ePCT. It will be transmitted electronically through to the preliminary examining authority, and you will get credit for what time it was in Switzerland, even if it's already past midnight, in the place where your preliminary examining authority is. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that sweet? And you don't have to figure out how to e-file in Korea or China or whatever. And somebody says, woohoo. Yes, that's exactly right. Woohoo. Okay, now. Um, so anytime you file any application that might be a priority document later, do what it takes to get it into DAS. Later, you will look in the transaction history and you'll look for these phrases to make sure that your case is on its way into the DAS system. Later, you will go into the DAS system and you will pull what is called a certificate of availability, which independently confirms that your case is in the DAS system. Then you will go into the DAS workbench and you will do what is called add tracking. So you will track your priority document so that you can make very sure that you know when it later has been retrieved electronically by some office later. With that in mind, we have a polling question. Have you at least once obtained a certificate of availability from DAS? 69% have not at least once obtained a certificate of availability from DAS. 
you know what this means. If you're going to be trendy, modern, and up-to-date, you got to start using DAS. Go to the Ant-like Persistence blog, go to the search box and plug in DAS quiz, do the DAS quiz, and you will become familiar with DAS. How do you get a pending application into DAS? Well, you, for, you find form PTO SB39, file it at the U.S. Patent Office. That's how you do it. Have you, at least once, set up tracking in the DAS system? Have you at least once set up tracking in DAS for at least one priority application? Fully 85% of our attendees, 222 attendees, fully 85% are not able to say that they have ever set up tracking even once in the DAS system. You realize you have some work to do here. Yeah, if you're going to be trendy, modern, and up-to-date, go to the Ant-like Persistence blog, go to the search box, plug in DAS quiz, and you will learn how to do it. Gosh sakes, folks, you need to be trendy, modern, and up-to-date. Can you add an ADS to a recently filed U.S. provisional? Uh, that's not the way to do it. You hand in Form PTO SB39, and Form SB39 will work for, for provisionals. So that's what you do to clean up the mess. If you filed a provisional and you failed to be trendy, modern, and up-to-date, just put Form SB39 in it, and, uh, and then eventually it will be in the DAS system. Okay. Uh, the DAS system also has notifications, and it will notify you when important things happen. On this screen, you can see down toward the bottom that the International Bureau successfully retrieved one of my U.S. provisionals just yesterday, just yesterday, uh, into a PCT application that I am uh, managing, or two days ago. Um, and here uh, you see a case where the USPTO retrieved a priority document from the Chinese Patent Office into one of my U.S. cases. Yeah. Okay, follow-on papers. When you have a pending PCT application, it's already been filed, and now you need to file some subsequent filing, some follow-on paper. How do you do it? Well, there are two choices, actions and uploads. And uh, one of the choices is, and actions are always better. When you do an action, it sort of preloads some of the data into various places in the WIPO systems uh, so that you're uh, several steps closer to whatever it is being done. In contrast, an upload is just like getting an image in there and somebody at WIPO then has to sort of work through it step by step. Clearly, it's better to do an action whenever you can. There's a secret tip I'm going to tell you, folks. This is a secret tip. It's not written down anywhere. Imagine the folks at the International Bureau and the various processing teams, and they get submissions of all kinds from all different directions. The secret thing is, if you do an EPCT action, they do those before they do the uploads, and they do those before they do the incoming faxes or whatever. So if you want it to be looked at right away, if to the extent you can, um, do it as an action. Oh, uh, so one of our nice people at WIPO says, if you want to set up EPCT for old cases where you didn't ask for email communication, you won't be able to since uh, they can't send out form IB345. So instead, go to a big long URL that I'm not going to try to read out loud, but uh, uh, go to the uh, uh, go to the, it's the big announcement about COVID-19. Go to that page and you'll end up having to send an email or something is what it amounts to. Uh, this slide is is repeating what I said earlier. If you if you have something you need to send to a searching authority that's like not the U.S. searching authority, you can uh, use EPCT to send something to the searching authority. Uh, and if you want to send something like a demand to the preliminary examining authority, you can do that through EPCT, and that can be very handy if the preliminary examining authority you have in mind is one that is not the U.S. preliminary examining authority. Now, one last little mention, and this is from uh, the USPTO, um, is never file your PCT with informal drawings. Always hand in formal drawings. You will frustrate yourself and you will annoy everyone in the PCT patent offices if you hand in informal drawings and later you try to get them to accept formal drawings. Why does WIPO make uploads even available if actions are better? And the answer is certain workflow tasks, they have not developed an action either because it's too complicated or, or they just haven't gotten to it yet. So there are certain ones where the upload is the only choice. 
can you pay fees through EPCT? Yes, many fees you can pay through EPCT. Not all. If you file a demand, you'll have to somehow get the demand money to the preliminary examining authority yourself. But many international bureau type fees, yes, you can pay them through EPCT. Um, uh, okay, let's see here. Um, Resources at WIPO. The help desk, which I am told you shouldn't actually call on the phone uh, and instead send emails. Um, they also have online help that's extremely good. The FAQ articles are extremely good. Um, I'm going to be doing some webinars next few weeks. One of them will be Get Patents Fast. It will be all about like PPH, Track 1, uh, making things special because the person's over 65 years old, uh, pre-office action interview program uh, pilots, uh, all about the different ways of getting patents fast. Uh, many of you read the news stories uh, about the uh, company that lost one of their CRISPR patents. Why? Because they screwed up Article 4 of the Paris Convention, same applicant or successor in title. I'm going to do a webinar about what you should do so you don't end up like them and lose an important patent by screwing up Article 4 of Paris. I'm going to do a whole webinar on docketing of PCT. You might want to get your docketing people attending that webinar. Webinar about picking a searching authority, a webinar about picking your receiving office, a webinar about making smart use of PCT declarations, a webinar on the pros and cons of national phase and bypass continuation as two different ways of trying to get a U.S. patent from a PCT, and a webinar all about how to handle sequence listings in your PCT filings. Additional resources you should subscribe to the Ant-like Persistence blog. It's inevitable. You're going to have to do it sooner or later. You might as well just do it and get it done. I promise I won't sell your email address to a spammer or something. Yes, you'll get email from me, but not from spammers. There is a PCT listserv. You should subscribe to it. You can just be a lurker. You don't have to post. Uh, and you'll learn a lot. You'll see people who will post questions. Other people will answer them. It's a great learning opportunity. What are ways to pay for PCT filings? And one answer is yes, you can pay with credit cards. Um, it's very convenient that WIPO has made it so that you can pay a lot of your fees with credit cards. Um, I will circulate these slides later as a handout by email. I will also circulate an evaluation form later. And with that, I will say thank you very much.